What's up everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing the ninth in the series of some answered questions. Uh, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. I got a new mic so everything's still a little up in the wash in terms of how I get everything to work correctly. I'm not sure if I have to be like all the way up here like, hey guys, welcome to my channel. Or if I can just talk normal. So the audio fades in and out, just stick with it. As you can see, I'm slowly making progress on my channel. Uh, things are getting a little better, a little more... Uh, fine-tune once I figure out how to do everything. So let's go ahead and get into uh, the ninth answer question regarding Baha'u'llah. Let me make sure that this is recording correctly. It appears to be. Baha'u'llah appeared at a time when Persia was plunged in the darkest ignorance and consumed by the blindest fanaticism. You have no doubt read at length the accounts that European histories provide of the morals, manners, and thoughts of the Persians during the last few centuries, and these require no repetition. Suffice it to say that Persia had sunk to such abysmal depths that foreign travelers would all deplore that a country, which had in former times occupied the pinnacle of greatness and civilization, had by then fallen into such abasement, desolation, and ruin, and that its people had been reduced to utter wretchedness. One of the main uh, tenets of the Baha'i faith is that we believe in progressive revelation, and that over time God sends his, men his messengers or manifestations of God to different peoples and uh, communities around the world depending upon their specific needs. And it is the most spiritually depraved, or deprived, I should say, civilization that uh, receives the bounty of a manifestation of God. So a lot of uh, European uh, dignitaries and diplomats and whatnot were in Persia during the 19th century. And this is one of the reasons why the Baha'i faith is one of the most historically accurate religions out there is because it's well one it's relatively modern it's new and two is just the fact that there are a wide variety of sources documenting and corrobor uh, corroborating make sure i say that correctly uh, the various occurrences that occurred uh, there's a really awesome historical account of the bobbies which are like the predecessors of the baha'i faith uh, known as dawn breakers and that's historically accurate now there's a, a gentleman named uh, brown i think it was uh I forget his first name, I'm sorry. I think it's E.G. Brown. But he was a, uh, uh, I think he was a Middle Eastern scholar from Oxford. And he studied various uh, cultures and countries in the Middle East. And he visited Persia during the 19th century. And he actually met Baha'u'llah and accounted how great of a man that he appeared in his presence and how he felt uh, such uh, respect towards Baha'u'llah. And so as you'll see with a lot of what uh, this is going to be talking about, it's going to be talking about the state and the nature of Persia during the 19th century, as well as uh, the character and the influence of Baha'u'llah. It was at such a time that Baha'u'llah appeared. His father was a court minister, not a divine, and it is well known throughout Persia that he never studied in a school or associated with the learned and the divines. He passed the early part of his life in the utmost comfort and happiness, and his companions and associates were Persians of rank rather than learned men. As soon as the Bab revealed his cause, Baha'u'llah proclaimed, This great man is the Lord of the righteous, and it is incumbent upon all to bear allegiance unto him. He arose to promote the cause of the Bab, adducing decisive proofs and conclusive arguments of his truth. Although the divines of the nation had obliged the Persian government to exert the most vehement opposition, although the Although they had all issued decrees ordering the massacre, pillage, persecution, and annihilation of the Bab's followers, and although throughout the land the people had undertaken to kill, burn, and plunder them, and even harass their women and children, despite all this, Baha'u'llah was engaged with the utmost constancy and composure in exalting the word of the Bab. Nor did he seek for a moment to conceal himself, but associated openly and visibly with his enemies, occupied himself with adducing proofs, and arguments and became renowned for exalting the word of God. Time and again he suffered intense adversities, and at every moment his life was in grave danger. He was put in chains and thrown into a subterranean dungeon. His extensive hereditary possessions were entirely plundered. He was four times exiled from land to land, and in the end he came to abide in the most great prison. That most great prison is a prison that I believe is still in Israel. It's in Akka, and it's, I think its name was the Sia Chal. And uh, it was where like a lot of the worst criminals in all of Persia were placed. Notwithstanding all this, the call of God was ceaselessly raised and the fame of his cause was noised abroad. Such were the knowledge, learning, and perfections he invents that everyone in Persia was astonished. 
all the learned people, friend and foe alike, who attained his presence in Tehran, Baghdad, Constantinople, Adrianople, and Akka received a complete and convincing answer to their every question. All readily acknowledged that in every perfection he was peerless and unique throughout the world. It often happened in Baghdad that Muslim, Jewish, and Christian divines and European men of learning would be gathered in his blessed presence. They would each ask a different question, and despite their varying beliefs, would each receive so complete and convincing a reply as to be fully satisfied. Even the Persian divines, residing in Karbala and Najaf, chose a learned man by the name of Mullah Hussan Amu and dispatched him as their representative. He came into his blessed presence and asked a number of questions on their behalf, to which Baha'u'llah responded. He then said, The divines fully recognize the extent of your knowledge and attainments, and it is acknowledged by all that you are without peer or equal in every field of learning. It is moreover evident that you have never studied or acquired this learning, but the divines say that they are not satisfied with this and cannot acknowledge the truth of your claim on the basis of your knowledge and attainments alone. They therefore ask you to produce a miracle in order to satisfy and assure their hearts. So keep this in mind. Right? So these Persian or um, Muslim divines... I, well, they were Persian. They basically stated that they uh, they found Baha'u'llah's character and conduct to be righteous and to be um, of the utmost excellence and standard. But yet they still refused to uh, believe what he had to say. And in the Baha'i faith, we don't have clergy. I mean, there are administrative um, individuals that kind of take care of, you know, like the day-to-day -day running of the faith. But we don't have a specific clergy where one person can start their own Baha'i faith and, you know, tell people what to believe. Uh, a major component of the Baha'i faith is personal investigation of the truth, and we don't proselytize. Now, we can educate and teach people about the faith, but we do not proselytize. Even in um, Israel, the uh, uh, Universal House of Justice, which is like the main head administrative body, and that's where you often see the uh, uh, Shrine of the Bab. It's really beautiful on Haifa and the gardens and everything. The, the Baha'is there do not teach the faith because it's, uh, they're not allowed. It's against the law. So Baha'is do not teach the faith in Israel. Baha'u'llah replied, Although they have no right to ask this, since it is for God to test his creatures and not for them to test God, yet their request is in this case accepted and allowed. But the cause of God is not a theatrical stage where every hour a new performance may be offered and every day a new demand presented. For otherwise the cause of God will become the plaything of children. Let the divines, therefore, assemble and choose unanimously one miracle, and let them stipulate in writing that once it has been performed, they will no longer entertain any doubt, but will acknowledge and confess the truth of this cause. Let them seal that paper and bring it to me. They must fix this as the criterion of truth. If it be performed, they should have no remaining doubt, and if not, we shall stand convicted of imposture. So think about this. Baha'u'llah basically told the divines, you know, the clergy, he said, all right, uh, it's not for you to dictate whether or not I should perform a miracle, but go ahead and pick any miracle of your choosing. I will perform it, and then after I perform it, you should you have to agree to what I'm saying, to my message. So that's you know, <laughs> that's a rather profound statement. That learned man arose and replied, "There is no more to be said." He kissed Baha'u'llah's knee, even though he was not a believer, and departed. Then he gathered the divines and conveyed Baha'u'llah's message. They consulted together and said, This man is a magician. Perchance he will perform some enchantment, and then we will have no recourse. And so they dared not respond. Mullah Hassan Amu, however, reported this fact in many gatherings. He left Karbala for Kerman Shah in Tehran, where he provided all with a detailed account of this episode and spoke of the fear and inaction of the divines. Our point is that all the adversaries of Baha'u'llah in the East acknowledge his greatness, distinction, knowledge, and learning, and that in spite of their enmity, they refer to him as the renowned Baha'u'llah. In brief, this most great luminary appeared suddenly above the horizon of Persia, and all the people of that land, whether ministers, divines, or the general populace, rose against him with the fiercest animosity, claiming that he was bent upon annihilating and extinguishing the religion, laws, nation, and empire, even as had been said of Christ. Yet Baha'u'llah alone and single-handed withstood them all without faltering in the slightest. It seems that whenever a new religion arises in the world, um, whether it be, you know, with Judaism, you know, superseding the previous pagans, I think there might have been like a prior monotheistic religion before Judaism, I forget what it was, but 
following that with Christianity and then like the Jews rejecting Christ and then the kind of the same thing with Islam and then with like the, the Buddhists and the Hindus. It's a recurring theme that the previous religion tries to stamp out the preceding one or the following one. At last they said, so long as this man is in Persia, there will be no peace or tranquility. He should be banished that Persia might again find rest. They subjected Baha'u'llah, therefore, to severe hardships so that he would be forced to seek permission to leave Persia, and they imagined that the lamp of the cause would be thereby extinguished. But this persecution produced the contrary effect. The cause grew in stature, and its flame waxed brighter. It had until then spread only within Persia. This caused it to spread to other regions. Later, they said, Iraq is too close to Persia. We must dispatch him to distant lands. Thus, the Persian government persisted until Baha'u'llah was exiled from Iraq to Constantinople. But again, they saw that he did not falter in the least. They said, Constantinople is a crossroads for diverse peoples and nations, and there are many Persians there. Hence, they took further steps and had him exiled to Adrianople. But that flame gathered still more intensity, and the cause grew even greater in stature. Finally, the Persians said, None of these locations was a place of humiliation. He must be sent to a place where he will be disgraced and subjected to trials and persecutions, and where his kindred and followers will suffer the direst afflictions. Thus, they chose the prison city of Akka, which was reserved for rebels, murderers, thieves, and highway robbers, and in this wise they made him associate with such people. But the power of God was made manifest, for this prison became the means of the promotion of his faith and the glorification of his word. The greatness of Baha'u'llah became apparent in that he succeeded from within such a prison and under such humiliating circumstances in wholly transforming the condition of Persia and overcoming his enemies and improving to all the resistless power of his cause. His sacred teaching spread to all regions, and his cause was firmly established. In every province of Persia, his enemies arose with the utmost hatred, seizing and killing, beating and burning, uprooting a thousand households, and resorting to every violent means to extinguish his cause. Notwithstanding all this, he promoted his cause and promulgated his teachings from within this prison of murderers, thieves, and highwaymen, awakening many of his most virulent enemies and making them firm believers. Such was the influence of his actions that the Persian government itself arose from its slumber and regretted what had been wrought at the hands of the wicked divines. So all this stuff that I'm reading to you here is, on, is an answer from Abdul Baha, who was the uh, son, of, one of the sons of Baha'u'llah. And if you want, you can look into this for yourself and this further clarified that various Europeans, um, the enemies of Baha'u'llah, the various dignitaries actually stated the stuff that Abdul Baha is saying. And a lot of it is well documented throughout other uh, sources that you can verify for yourself. When Baha'u'llah arrived at this prison in the Holy Land, discerning souls were awakened to the fact that the prophecies which God had voiced through the tongue of his prophets two or three thousand years before had been realized, and that his promises had been fulfilled. For he had revealed unto the certain prophets and announced unto the Holy Land that the Lord of hosts would be manifested therein. All these promises were fulfilled, and but for the opposition of his enemies and his banishment and exile, it can scarcely be imagined how Baha'u'llah could have left Persia and pitched his tent in this sacred land. His enemies intended that this imprisonment should completely destroy and annihilate his cause, but his incarceration became instead the greatest confirmation in the means of its promotion. The call of God reached the east and the west, and the rays of the Son of Truth illumined every land. Praise be to God. Though he was a prisoner, his tent was raised on Mount Carmel, and he moved about with the utmost majesty. And whoever entered his presence, be it friend or stranger, would exclaim, This is not a captive, but a king. Immediately upon his arrival in prison, he addressed an epistle to Napoleon, which he sent through the French ambassador, the substance of which was, Ask what crime we have committed to be confined in this prison. Napoleon made no reply. Now this isn't uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, because he was in the beginning of the 19th century, but I believe this was Napoleon III. Then a second epistle was issued, which is contained in the Suri e Haikal, in which in substance says, O Napoleon, since thou hast failed to heed and answer my call, thou shalt lose thy dominion and be reduced to naught. This epistle was dispatched to Napoleon by post through the care of Cesar Zatafejo, and with the full knowledge of his companions in exile. The text of this address quickly reached all of Persia, for the Kitab e Haikal was sent at that time to every corner of that land, and this address was included therein. 
This took place in the year 1869, and as a Suri Hekal had been circulated throughout Persia and India, all the believers had it in their hands and were awaiting the outcome of this address. Not long after, in 1870, the fire of war was ignited between Germany and France, and although no one at the time anticipated the triumph of Germany, Napoleon was resoundingly defeated, surrendered to his enemies, and saw his glory change into deepest abasement. Tablets were likewise dispatched to other kings, among them an epistle to His Majesty Nazarene Din Shah. In that epistle, Baha'u'llah said, Summon me to thy presence, and gather all the divines, and ask for proof and testimony, that truth might be distinguished from error. His Majesty sent Baha'u'llah's epistle to the divines and assigned them this task, but they dared not undertake it. He then asked seven of the most renowned divines to respond to this epistle. After a while, they returned it, saying, This man is an opponent of the faith and an enemy of the king. His Majesty the Shah of Persia was sorely vexed and said, This is a matter of proof and testimony, of truth and error. What has it to do with enmity towards the government? How pitiful that we have shown forth such respect to these divines, and yet they cannot even reply to this address. Briefly, all that was recorded in the tablets to the kings has come to pass. One need only compare their contents with the events that have transpired since the year 1870 to see that every prediction has been fulfilled, save for a few that remain to be manifested in the future. Moreover, foreign peoples and non-believers attributed wondrous works to Baha'u'llah. Some believed he was a saint, and some even wrote accounts to this effect, such as Seed Davudi, a Sunni divine of Baghdad, who composed a short treatise in which he related in some connection certain extraordinary feats of Baha'u'llah. To this day, there are people throughout the East who do not believe in Baha'u'llah as a manifestation of God, but who regard him as a saint and attribute miracles to him. To summarize, not a single soul, whether friend or foe, who attained Baha'u'llah's presence failed to acknowledge and attest to his greatness. Although he might not become a believer, he would invariably bear witness to his greatness. No sooner would someone appear before him than the encounter would produce such an impression as to prevent him, in most cases, from uttering a word. How often would a bitter enemy resolve in his heart to say such and such or to argue so and so when he had attained his presence, only to find himself amazed, bewildered, and reduced to utter silence? Baha'u'llah never studied Arabic, had a teacher or a tutor, or tutor, or entered a school. Nevertheless, his eloquence and fluency in spoken Arabic, as well as in his Arabic tablets, would astonish the most articulate and accomplished among the Arab men of letters, and all acknowledge that in this his attainments were without peer or equal. So that's another thing that you can actually verify for yourself is whether or not Baha'u'llah ever uh, attained any sort of education in Arabic. And uh, he didn't, but yet some of the writings that he's written are just uh, really impressive. There's a really famous uh, series of writings called the Hidden Words, which are written in both Persian and Arabic. And uh, basically they consist of the world's major religious themes condensed into short epithets as a... Uh, way to glean some of the insight of religion in a more concise manner and those are really awesome they kind of remind me of the psalms so maybe i'll do another uh, video on that at some point and those are really good too like if you just want to read a little bit of something like you don't want to read like a whole bunch of spiritual stuff and you just want to read like maybe a paragraph or less th there's a lot of wisdom in those uh, little sayings If we carefully examine the text of the Torah, we see that none of the manifestations of God ever said to those who denied them, Whatever miracle you desire, I am ready to perform, and I will submit to whatever test you propose. Yet in his epistle to the Shah, Baha'u'llah clearly stated, Gather together the divines and summon me to thy presence, that the proof and testimony might be established. For fifty years Baha'u'llah withstood his enemies like a mountain. They all sought to annihilate him. They all assailed him. They plotted a thousand times to crucify and destroy him, and throughout those fifty years he was in the greatest peril. As to Persia, which to this day remains in such an abject and ruinous state, every man of wisdom, whether from within or without her borders, who knows her true state of affairs, recognizes that her progress, her prosperity, and her civilization depend entirely upon the promulgation of the teachings and the dissemination of the principles of this glorious being. In his blessed lifetime, Christ educated in reality only eleven souls the greatest of whom Peter nonetheless denied him thrice when put to the test. Notwithstanding this, behold how the cause of Christ subsequently pervaded the whole earth. And this day Baha'u'llah has educated thousands of souls who, under the threat of the sword, 
have raised to the highest heaven the cry of, O thou the glory of glories, and whose faces have shone as brightly as gold in the crucible of trials. Infer then from this what shall transpire in the future. Now we must be fair and acknowledge what an educator of mankind this illustrious being was, what marvelous signs he has manifested, and what power and might have been realized in the world of existence through him. So there's a, a lot to take in there, and kudos to you if you've listened or watched this whole video. You know, I appreciate that. Um, I think one of the main takeaways is the uh, the exemplary life that Baha'u'llah lived and uh, the various uh, similarities to the other manifestations of God in many respects. You know, like the Buddha, he was um, of noble birth, and Baha'u'llah was actually known as the father of the poor because he would often, you know, spend his time with the poor of his society and provide a lot of charity to them. And his writings have a profound impact on those that read him. And the harmony of science and religion in terms of his teachings is also really interesting. But we can see from a lot of this uh, text here that there's a lot of stuff that occurred, you know, in Persia during the 19th century that you can validate for yourself. And another interesting uh Occurrence, you know how we talked about before with Napoleon, how Baha'u'llah addressed him and then Napoleon basically ignored what he said. He sent these letters to like all of the, uh, well, most of the rulers of the world. He sent them to the president of the United States. He sent stuff to uh, France, Germany, I believe Russia as well, uh, and the UK. And of all of the rulers, Queen Victoria was the only one that gave an even uh, neutral response. She basically said something along the lines of that, if this is of God, no harm will come from it. And if it's not of God, then, you know, surely it will disappear or whatever without harm or with, you know, it will not live up to what it's saying. And so Baha'u'llah told her that since she was able to at least listen to what he was saying somewhat impartially, that her kingdom would um, subsist and her monarchy would uh, still attain its throne. And to this day, I think the... The British monarchy is the only uh, monarchy from that time that is still in existence. I might be wrong, but I mean from that from the individuals that Baha'u'llah wrote to. But yeah, there's a lot there. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks again for checking this out. Uh, hopefully, you can hear everything as I have this new mic. But um, thanks again, and until next time, uh, take care. I really need to work on a kill switch for. Uh, editing these videos so that way when I say take care or whatever and I sign off I just sign off you don't have to see me like go through here find out where the uh, stop button is and all that good stuff